my guest today is American Armenian scientist and entrepreneur, philanthropist, co founder of Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, Nubar Afeyan. Hi, Nubar. Hi, Mark. Great to be here. Uh, let me start this conversation with a quote from you. And that quote will be, no one is an expert in developing Armenia. You are an expert in developing and launching new ventures. Now, can we compare the new post-Soviet Armenia to a startup, to a new venture? And what lessons can Armenia, a country, learn from startups? Well, Mark, I've said the, the, the comment you, you referenced in, in relation to the question I often get asked and have been asked for the past 20 years since getting involved in the first steps towards uh, development of Armenia, which was the Armenia 2020 project that Ruben Vartanen and I launched together with colleagues uh, almost 20 years ago. And that question all along was, what gives you the the belief that you have anything to add to the development of the country. And, and indeed, as a trained scientist and engineer um, and not working in political science or government, etc., that's a valid question or economics. But over the years, what I've come to learn is that the, the advancement of a country, uh, particularly when you have so much to do to get to a level of relevance that we all aspire to, is not the expertise of any one person. There is no background that ideally suits you for that activity because it is so integrative and it is so much uncertainty uh, that, that you have to face. So, so my answer nowadays is really that I may not be an expert in this, but I'm not sure that anybody is. And that's really an invitation to not kind of opt out of this responsibility but rather to opt in. All of us can belong to the club that is dedicated to making Armenia a much, much better place. And, and, and I don't think you need qualifications for that, in my view. Now, as to your question about startups, um, indeed, there's aspects of, of country development that do resemble a startup because you need to think about what are your core resources, what are your core capabilities and competitive advantages and you need to give people a sense of believing that you could be a much better place. You could be able to create a lot of value. And from there, together with a plan, not just a belief system, to actually start implementing. The one thing I've learned from startups that I think matters a lot is this notion of whether in developing a country, you should think of destinations or you should think of directions. Most people, are more comfortable choosing a direction. But indeed, when it comes to transformation, what's important is to pick a destination. All startups, when they write a business plan, actually are describing their destination. Whether it's five years from now or 25 years from now, they are ultimately saying, if I get the money and the execution to be able to do this, I can create a new world in which this is what's, what's the value uh, proposition. And in that regard, there are similarities. There are big differences, of course, as well. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, you are an expert in uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, there is another element, you know, in, in, in being innovative and being entrepreneurial. It's leadership. You should be, I mean, a leader should have some sort of uh, quality, several, several qualities. What qualities would you put at the top of the list? If we're talking about um, doing things that have not been done before, uh, that, is, that is kind of, that's what I mean by transformation. Um, mm -hmm. Advancement, you can, you can do with, with, with different approaches, but when you're trying, like, talking about major leaps and major transformation, then I think you need to, to well, I, one I mentioned already, which is being very, very much future centric. That is to try to come up with clear descriptions of a future that are compelling so that people will, will take the risk and put the hard work to getting there. But also I think you have to be comfortable communicating 
the uncertainties, because I think while people in the, in the population may not be as comfortable uh, embracing uncertainty, those uncertainties don't go away. And so having a way to communicate in the face of uncertainty, I think it takes incredible adaptive, adaptivity. So the property of being rapidly adapting to the situation, uh, which is a leadership skill that is not necessary uh, in, in many, many contexts, but in the context of, of, of really forging major new programs, that's an important skill set. Of course, there are many, many others. Leadership is a topic that is a lot of basic things and then a few special things. I'm mentioning some of the special things. Now, uh, when you say this uh, uh, ability of dealing with uncertainty, what helps there? You know, uh, when, when we're talking about a country and about development to a specific place where we want this country to be. Uh, no. there, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's a good question and I will try to answer it, although um, it's, it's quite specific to the personalities involved as well. But I would say, you know, over the years, maybe I'll, I'll answer it this way, Mark, I have found in, in the entrepreneurial kind of world, the, the, the big, you know, where, where you try to do what in this country people call unicorns, where you're trying to go from zero to billions of dollars of value and over and over and over again, which is what my, what my company at Flagship has been attempting to do and have done for many times. I think that the, the, the best description I can give you is a mindset, uh, which I call paranoid optimism. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you need to be able to, as a person, at the same time, be optimistic about what can be accomplished and, 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 and sometimes see things that others don't see and believe that you can take people there. But at the same time, you need to be paranoid about the assumptions that you're making in order to feed the, parano uh, the, the optimism. So this duality of paranoid and optimist, it's a fairly tortured state, I will say, and many entrepreneurs live in this tortured state because the paranoia makes you nervous, makes you poised, makes you humble, makes you humble because when you're thinking from the paranoid side of your brain, you constantly are imagining all the ways in which things can fail and how you're gonna overcome them. And that's an important thing. Look, I think it is easier to kind of ignore that side of one's brain, focus on optimism and, and call it pragmatism, which is kind of having it be based in reality, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's hard to make big advancements if all you do is what everybody else is doing. You need to do some things that are different, that are daring. And the only safety valve for that I've found over the years is this duality. Think of it as a, uh, a brake and a gas pedal with the steering wheel in your hand. If you don't have a gas pedal and a brake, you can drive off of a cliff doesn't matter what the steering wheel is doing. And you need the two, you need to be able to, but, but look, the other thing I'll say is I use the word humility. I think when you're facing uncertainty in leadership, people often want to assert the reality, to assert the truth, to assert what's gonna happen so that the leader seems that they know a lot. My experience is that when you have extreme uncertainty, that is a problematic uh, uh, approach because it's patently, clear that nobody knows what's actually going to happen. And as a leader, if you're able to be humble and communicate that there's a lot of uncertainties, but here is what we're going to do first. And then here's five other things we could do if that one doesn't work. And so kind of get people to understand that this is a, a bit of an adaptive a strategy. It's not a determined, you know, kind of a, a doctrinal approach. That is what I find in startups. And I suspect in developing, rapidly developing countries, just looking at the Lee Kuan Yew example, for example, uh, having had a, the honor of spending some time talking with him, I see some elements of that in the way he thought about Singapore. And I think also there is another element to that. It is keep questioning yourself. Exactly. That's what I mean by paranoid, by the way, is that don't drink your own Kool-Aid is the way we call it in this country. So even though you believe what you believe, question it, so that as things change, you can pick up the new signal much more quickly than if you didn't question it, except once a year or once six months. That, that is when you're not gonna be quickly enough adapting. 
Now, uh, Nubar, when I came back to Armenia some uh, seven years ago, I noticed that we Armenians are very good in talking about the past. But there is something we must, I mean, there is the future we must think about if we want to create uh, our own future. Uh, so there should be some sort of a change in the way we think. How do you think it should happen? If, if it should happen, of course. Yeah, no, this, is a, this is a very difficult, difficult topic. And, and one, again, in the world that I live in, in startups and in technology and biotechnology, this is a, a very, very important issue. Um, look, I think that as humans, we are more comfortable with what we are familiar with. And the past, because it's already happened, it's something we're familiar with. Um, our memories tend to remember good things or bad things. So the past always looks better than it really was. Just a, an optimism bias that we have that comes from uh, how it's just been well documented that, that that also comes backwards as to what we choose to, to remember. And, and so I think that that is something that is completely natural. On the other hand, um, as we look at the future, I think that most of us are operating with the, with the belief that the future is gonna happen. Nobody can predict the future, and that's true, uh, as it relates to accuracy. Accuracy of prediction is hard. And so therefore, why bother spending a lot of time talking about the future? The future is the result of what we do today. Eventually, the future will appear. I believe in the opposite. I believe that if you, if you, if you want to create a future, that is more attractive for you to live in than the present, then what you need to do is literally be obsessive about all the possible futures that could exist. Envision them in your mind. That's why, you know, I'd say in, in, in human beings, probably the one of the most, if not the most advanced capability we have is imagination. It's not thought, it's imagination. It's being able to simulate alternative realities ahead of time and compare them. And so one of the things that I'll kind of describe, Mark, to you, and again, some of this will seem esoteric and unrelated, but I would invite the audience to stop and think about it. We have the ability to imagine multiple different versions of a week from now and multiple different versions of a month from now or a year from now. We choose not to do it because we think, what's the purpose of doing it? But we have the facility to do it. Now, I would argue that by, by being able to envision the alternative futures and then talking between people about the merits of different alternatives, you can begin to get a consensus around what might be a desirable destination. It's much harder to argue, should I go left, should I go right, based on what? Well, you know, I think right is where the money is or right is where the power is. It, it, arbitrary discussions. But if you say, I want to, in five years, have a country that has this, this, this advancement, this uh, GDP, this level of equality, this level of governance, then you work backwards and you say, okay, well, if I want to get there, what did I have to do two years from now? So I'm, I'm describing something that is well known to people. They call it scenario analysis. But my appeal, especially at this moment in Armenian life, is that we need, look, as a people, we have been uprooted and derooted over and over in our history. And I believe, having been born in Lebanon, grew up in Lebanon and then Montreal, Canada before coming here and spending uh, five, six trips a year to Armenia for the last 20 years, I don't know where my roots are. I don't know in what country they are. I don't know in what time they are. So it gives me the ability to choose to put my roots into the future. So imagine a tree, if you were a tree and your roots were 10, 20 years in the future and you still live today, but in order to fulfill what your roots are trying to pull you towards, that's a different way to live. It's a different way to discuss future. And so, you know, we've said with a lot of colleagues that when we do work in Armenia, our ultimate client, our ultimate customer is a five-year-old because that five-year-old is only going to benefit 15, 20 years from now. 
has no voice, has no political power. And if we don't collectively create that better future, then they're going to be, uh, uh, they, they, by the time they get there, it's too late for them. Now, I'll say one other thing, Mark, sorry, I'm going on and on. Uh, most people will say, yeah, but people are suffering today. They said it back in 2001, they say it now in 2020. People are suffering today and we can't prioritize the future over the present. The problem is if you don't prioritize the future over the present, you will be condemned to the same present with no matter what. And so what you need to do is to get people to realize that a significant amount of the work has to be to ensure a better future so that the present, as painful as it is, has a purpose. Otherwise, imagine being in a bad present, present and then imagining a bad future. That's why people immigrate. So I'll say one other thing to come to immigration just for a second. Think about whether people would immigrate away from something that they thought within two, three, five, ten years credibly could become where they would have wished they immigrated without having to leave their ethnicity, their, their scenery, their family, whatever. I think that is the goal we should all take. Nobar, we will come to immigration, I mean, I believe straight uh, with the next question. But when we are talking about scenario building, when we are talking about building, you know, what we want to achieve in the future and how shall we go there? That's difficult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's probably quite difficult and many politicians, they just being, uh, you know, very uh, good speakers, good talking people and very charismatic people, they just cannot do that in many cases. That is a big problem, Mark. I've, I've come to learn over the decades that I've spent now and that's just, you know, and I've talked to many other now uh, leaders in other countries, given the rest of my activities also recently uh, with, 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 with some of the work on the vaccines and the like, I've had occasion, and, and through Aurora, by the way, to interact with many different types of leaders in other countries. And, and, and what I would agree with you is that the kind of the political realm is, is people who are trying to figure out what is the most palatable, attractive version of the present that people will support and vote for. And, and, and essentially, the, it, it, if you figure out what that is, then that becomes the platform. Whereas a future, heavily future-centered, future-rooted platform is quite disturbing to the present. And therefore, it's difficult to imagine how, how one gets votes by by projecting, describing, and, and planning for a set of sacrifices until such a future is achieved. Unfortunately, that's the way in which change is gonna happen, no matter what the country is. And, and unfortunately for us Armenians, ironically, all the Armenians in the diaspora physically went to a place where a different future awaited them and they adopted the future. They adopted not, the, not only the country, but the future that that country could offer them. But we have no experience actually bringing that future to Armenia. And, and I agree, political process, voting uh, disadvantages this topic. I can tell you that over the, over the years and years that we've worked on scenarios and projects that look to change significant parts about, about the future of Armenia, we were largely marginalized by the whoever were in the even intelligentsia or the government at the time, because it seemed esoteric, it seemed ambiguous, it seemed not politically relevant. Uh, and and I think that that's why we're far from the reality. Here. Sorry? Too philosophical and a bit far from the reality, right? It's the reality we need to get to. If we're not happy with the current reality, why should we obsess over the current reality? This is what we're trying to get away from. So the question is, what are we trying to go to? That's the problem is if you keep thinking about the present reality, you, you don't have any way of taking the steps needed to get to a new reality and, and you're, you're dead on. That is the problem with change. Nobody really wants it. Now, uh, Nubar, uh, as I promised, the next question is about uh, diaspora. And we are basically a nation of immigrants. 
in all these years of existence of the Third Armenian Republic, we have been trying to understand and creating a role for the diaspora in Armenia. I think so far, the only thing we have learned is that diaspora is not just for sending money to Armenia, but that's a negative lesson. I'm sure there are also positive lessons uh, and, and we need them, don't we? Well, what's, <laughs> I can talk about generally the diaspora, but look, I think that since Armenia achieved its most recent independence, diaspora has itself undergone a quiet revolution in that what was a comfortable feeling before of, of uh, preservation of, 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 of diasporan Armenianness, spürka haya bahbanum, not haya bahbanum, but spürka, the, the maintaining the variant of Armenian we had become and, and staunchly defending it, whether you're from Lebanon or Iran or, or, or in Canada, that, that became threatened because we had another form of Armenia to, to, to or Armenianness to protect, and which was the Armenia centric, state centric version of the new reality. And I'd say in the last 30 years, we have as a diaspora collectively done very, very, very little compared to what is possible in, in adjusting to that new reality. Because just like the country feels threatened by the difficulties of day-to-day -day life, in the diaspora, it became even more difficult to do what we used to do, because what we used to do was predicated on not having a country. We were happily in exile. And so that reality, Mark, I'm sad to say 30 years later really hasn't changed all that much. I'm of course not talking about Russian based Armenians or Armenians living in Turkey who are a special kind of Georgia, a special kind of diaspora. I'm talking about the diasporas that were formed after the genocide primarily. So I think that the current environment we're in and the crisis that we, what we face, which we may wanna come back and talk about are, is an opportunity perhaps for the diaspora, which is of course not a homogeneous thing to also ask itself why does it want to belong to this club, to this sect of being Armenian and what responsibilities come with that? And, and as, a, as an American Armenian, I know what my responsibilities to, to America are, but I have no idea what my responsibilities to Armenia should be or are. I, you know, diasporans have no say in, in any of the day-to-day -day decisions that are made. A lot of people say, nor should they have, and perhaps they're right. But then the question is, then what should they do? And, and I, I hope that the current crisis invites much more uh, kind of difficult discussions about our roles and responsibilities in building an Armenian nation, uh, rebuilding an Armenian nation. You know, we several years ago issued a, an appeal in 2016, maybe it was, in the New York Times and other places to call for Armenians to form a global Armenian network that could become a source of, of, of energy and support and stability for Armenia as a country. Um, that hasn't been very much uh, uh, echoed or received, but I, I think there are many, uh, there's so much more to do at this moment, and I'm hoping the moment will allow some of these things to happen. And I think also that uh, Armenia has a lot to do in this respect because it's not only about using the potential of the diaspora, it's also inviting diasporans and helping diaspora uh, uh, Armenians to uh, come into contact with, uh, you know, with, with uh, Armenia proper. Uh, and I, I also think that uh, we, we all have a lot to do here. Yeah, I would say, Mark, to that end, it has been difficult I think to the authorities, no matter who they are over the years, to truly welcome input from external Armenian sources. It's been my observation that people have been far more willing to take ex expert input from non-Armenians uh, because they've felt that at least they're not being critical, they're just being helpful. But I think that we have a personality collectively where if another Armenian says something, it's viewed as criticism immediately. 
And so people don't want to hear the criticism. They figure, well, what do you know about what it's like here? You don't know, I don't want to become Ireland. I don't want to become Singapore. And they rapidly dismiss it as though kind of Armenia has to be built in strictly an Armenian way, which is nobody knows what it is, the current status quo prevails. I, it takes incredible self-confidence and incredible self-doubt to be open to other people's opinion, especially other Armenians' opinion. Uh, uh, are we coming here to this um, uh, paranoid optimism, as, as you said? I, I think so. It takes, it's, not, it's, it's hard work every minute of every day. Look, I, I tell people very often, when, when there's a lot of uncertainty about what to do, clearly the country currently faces massive uncertainty of what to do in every, in every dimension, uh, it, it, you have to be seeking the truth. Nobody owns the truth right now. Nobody knows what to do and what will be the most successful strategy. But when you then uh, seek input, you cannot feel like when people are questioning you, that therefore they're doubting you and they're criticizing you across the board. This is not meant for any one person. This is meant for every institution that we have, every institution, uh, 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 unions of different types all around the world, you know, kind of our own organizations, government institutions, academia, everybody feels like if you question them, you've questioned them. And therefore, you don't trust them and you don't believe them. And then they question you back by saying, who are you to question? And then it's lost because, because nobody who's questioning them actually knows the truth. I don't know any answers. I've told people that for years and years. But I know a few questions. And if they're not willing to hear the questions, I am sure that they're not going to get the right answers. We came here to another uh, important uh, um, uh, element in our conversation. Unfortunately, I believe it's going to be the last element in uh, our conversation because there are also several questions that came from the public and I would like to put forward some of them. Now, this last element is we here in Armenia, we are very good in critics, in, cri in critique, uh, but critique is directed to the past or to the present in the best case scenario. Uh, if we are going to think about future, we need programs and not critics. Uh, but it looks, uh, I mean, it's very hard to find public demand for programs, does it? Both in politics and in business here in Armenia. I, I, mm? Well, look, I think that the only thing we're sure of is it's a little bit like trying to talk about the weather tomorrow. Generally, you will be right if you predict this the same as today, more often than not. That's not a prediction. That's just projecting the status quo. I, I find that the only thing that is people feel comfortable with is what they've already done or what they're doing now. So I, I agree with you. You know, you, the, the critique that you're talking about, I use slightly different words. I tell people, in the medical profession, you have diagnostics and then you have treatments. The value of diagnostics without treatments actually is, is very low because what is supposed, somebody supposed to do with knowing that they have something, but there's nothing that you can offer them to do something about it. I think our job collectively is to marry up diagnostics with treatments, even if the treatments aren't guaranteed, even if they're not even tested, but we need to offer here's what I observe and here's what to do about it. And that's where some of the programs come from. You know, look, it is clear that we need for the countries, you know, the, to me, the biggest issue with the country right now is security. It's not physical military security only, it is security of every kind. Security economically, security health-wise, educationally, socially, security has to be for the next hundred years, in my view, our, we took our guard down. You know, what, when, when Armenia became part of the Soviet Union, our security broadly, all aspects of security was outsourced to a larger collective. And then when we were on our own again 30 years ago, I don't think that our security was as broadly understood to be our number one, two and three priorities uh, as opposed to anything else. Uh, you know, I, I would observe that having won the, the Ghalabagh war 25 years ago, it may have made us somewhat more self-assured about our security. Again, I'm not talking militarily, 
I'm saying in our abilities to build the country, etc. And and I the paranoid in me says that if you think about security, you'll always find things that are going to be serious challenges. So how we think about security, how we think about honesty with each other, which is the other big big thing that has to come with programs. You know, if you're going to propose programs, you have to tell people what's the reality in the area that you're trying to offer a program in. There's very little transparency of information. We don't know what the economic sectors are like. We don't know, we didn't, until a couple of years ago, we didn't know who was paying taxes, who was not. And so I think that we just have to think, I'm not, by the way, preaching in the sense of, I know the answer. I don't know the answer, but I know that the answer will has to be consistent and built upon reality and the truth. And, and I think that when you're talking about the future, maybe Mark, before we go to other questions, I'll say one last thing. You know, if you're going to build a future that is a big leap from where you are today, you have to make sure that the foundation of the leap, which is your understanding of the present, is real. If it's not real and you have an illusion about the present and you want to leap to the future, I think that's a very different activity because you might have selected the wrong future because it's completely incompatible with what the givens were. And so I think if you insist on a level of, of, of clarity of what the reality is, and then choose from among options, programs follow, and then the critiques become constructive because they always come with action. Yes, and, and leaning in illusions and with illusions is another problem that we are facing in our everyday life. Now, coming to the questions that we received from the public. Uh, a lot of these questions, maybe over 80% of them, are about uh, 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 the uh, Moderna uh, 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 vaccine and COVID-19. I am not going to ask you these questions because I think they are a bit outside of uh, our today's conversation. There is one question that just arrived and uh, uh, I would like to start with it. Do you think that the excessive participation of the diaspora in the politics of Armenia may threaten the national security of the Republic of Armenia? Well, the question is formulated by the word excessive. And mm -hmm. of course, excessive anything can threaten the underlying thing. And so the question becomes, what is excessive? And, and look, I would say from a nation building standpoint, um, Armenians in, didn't choose to be in the diaspora. They were forced to be in the diaspora. And those Armenians in the diaspora never had anybody Armenian to talk about life with generally, meaning their political life, their societal life. The, you know, when you're an American watching what's happening on television two days ago with the capital being invaded, I'm not talking to Armenians about that. I'm talking to Americans about that. And we don't have the culture, the political culture as Armenians all around the world to talk among ourselves about what it is to belong, what it is to be part of a society. And so I would say some level of political discourse amidst diaspora Armenians is actually good because that will make them aware of what it is to govern, what it is to be governed, what, what is the social contract, right? I mean, there's a whole notion of a social contract. Right now, a diaspora Armenian has no social contract with any Armenian state. They don't have any form of a social Armenian contract. What if there was such a thing? What if we discussed what would be in it, what would not be in it? So I agree that diasporans, you know, there are limits to what diaspora Armenians can and should do. There's, of course, questions about where was somebody's paying taxes, where somebody's sending, you know, kind of from militaries. All of those things can be discussed. But I would invite the audience to think that if we can uh, awaken a political science sensibility across the Armenian nation globally, uh, 20 years from now, there will be some real leaders coming from anywhere in the world who will dedicate their lives to create better Armenians. It's because we don't have any of that. I did not grow up, honestly, I did not grow up with any exposure 
to thinking, okay, what's, a good, what's the, the elements of a great Armenia? And I don't think most of us have. It's all about going back to, to Turkey and reclaiming our lands. That's not politics. That's an, an important cause. But politics involves what are you going to do with poverty? What are you going to do with inequality? What are you going to do with, 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 with equity, corruption, uh, truth, uh, on and on and on, foreign relations. So I would say we can all afford a little more of caring about these things. But I agree with the questioner. If it becomes excessive, it's ungovernable. Now, Nubar, uh, one of the questions we received earlier is, uh, again, about the same issue. Uh, aid to Armenia is disjointed. As many organizations are involved in this process, each doing their own thing. Can we form a uniform body that can work in conjunction with the Armenian government and the diaspora to uh, help these organizations work in unison uh, to better Armenia? We can and we should, but it's proven super difficult Mark, and I'll, and I'll come back to the same topic we've been talking about, which is that if we don't share a common vision of a future, why unite, right? We, we all think we know better than the other people, and we all doubt that the other person's money is going to the right place, right? So, so a, you know, in, when we give, it's a, it, the definition of a second is the time between when we give and when we wonder if it went to the right place. Well, that's, that, that comes from living just in the moment. If we could broadly have discussions and, and bit by bit start kind of a, agreeing on a shared view, maybe not a completely identical view, then of course we could do things that, that benefit from, from a sense of, of, of collectivism, if not unity. I mean, unity to me is the ultimate kind of form of collectivism. I don't think we need unity, but we need to have a collective understanding of what some common goals are, and we don't have that. Let me agree with you on that because we don't need unity and to have differences is actually better. It's better from the point of view of today and it's also better from the point of view of understanding of where we are going. You know, being different, offering different uh, uh, approaches and maybe different futures. We uh, also have the choice of where do we want to go. And when we are all unified and united, uh, there is only one future and we don't know, uh, I mean, and we, 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 we leave ourselves without a choice. I agree. Look, I, uh, Mark, I, I believe, given what I do in my scientific life, in, uh, very, as you would expect, in, in biology and nature as a very kind of uh, important teacher of many things. Among them is the fact that nature solves problems through many parallel approaches. Uh, the ones that survive end up unpredictable given the fact that you don't know what the threat is, but when the threats arrive, the ones that survive are, are not kind of one thing, but are many different solutions that are at any given time competing for it. To me, you know, kind of political thought and political agendas are that type of a competitive environment and, 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 and differences in thought, not just in the, about governance, but about what the future should be, are imperative, absolutely imperative, but, but they define a set of common values. That's the other thing, is that if you talk about alternative futures and you realize that 90% you know, of them all have three, four things that seem to keep coming up over and over, you can then at least say, let's agree on these common values, these common principles, and, and that brings us together. And then the particular versions may keep us apart so that if one of them end up being better than the other, we could switch and follow the other. That, that is super consistent with the way nature works. Thank you. And uh, we have time, I think, for another, for a last question. Uh, uh, one, uh, a member of the public says, I understand that the president of Armenia is these days holding discussions with many organizations about the immediate situation facing Armenia and its future. Is he going to meet with the at the crossroads team? <laughs> well, uh, I think it's I think it's it's fair to say, given the number of public uh, 
discourses we've had with the, with the president, as well as the prime minister quite separately, not to mix the two roles. But with the president, we have relationships that go back 20 years and, and he has been involved actually when he was in his prior life in various of our projects in, in, in honorary roles, uh, as well as being parts of the board, uh, whether it be with, you know, being part of the, the, the FAST, the, the Foundation for Armenian Science Technology, board and, and many other things. So we are uh, very much um, kind of aware of each other's hopes and dreams for the future. And we have always stood ready to, to engage in discussing, again, with all humility, with all recognition that we don't have the answers, but we know a few questions uh, in, in, in building a brighter future. I think we all want the same thing. We may have different ways of getting there. And um, since this is the last question, I'll just end by saying that, you know, for anybody listening to this, who, which, who has affinity for Armenians, not just is Armenian, because we can debate what the definition of that is. Mark, you may know that in the last few years, I have invited all Armenians to become Armenians by choice, as opposed to Armenians by birth, indicating thereby their commitment to what an Armenian will be in the future, not Armenian as some kind of a birthright. But I, I, whatever, whoever, however we do it, I think that this is the moment where our commitment to Armenia's future is the hope that the people, especially who live in Armenia today need. Uh, just committing to taking care of the current problems isn't going to change anything. So we need to do both. And we both, and we all, uh, of course, w wish uh, our president to get well as soon as possible, because as we speak, he is sick with coronavirus in London. Indeed, indeed. And let's uh, finish our uh, dialogue. It's a, it was a very interesting dialogue. I would love to continue it, but the time is limited. Uh, my guest today was an American Armenian scientist, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and co-founder of Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, Nubar Afeyan, and I'm Mark Grigorian, a journalist. Goodbye.